today we're going to talk about designing a flexible system to accommodate forage growth that is ever changing. Did anyone here graze livestock during the drought of uh, 2017? It started in the fall of 2017. And then through the winter, it was really dry. Great, great winter for calving because it was really dry, but it lasted to the end of April, that cold winter when we had uh, the second coldest April on record, followed by that hotter than blue blazes summer, which started with the vengeance when we had the hottest May on record. And that then contributed to our epic drought of 2018, especially up here in North Missouri, which lasted right up until those monsoons started in the fall, followed by that bone chilling wind and snow storms over the winter and add to it the floods of 2019. Most of those pictures all came within just a few miles of my house between the fall of 17 and the spring of 19. And so we had we experienced everything from severe drought to severe flooding there in that very short period of time. So how do we design a grazing system that will accommodate pastures that look like this one spring and like this the following spring? So in the spring of, uh, of 2018, when we had that cold April and warm May, we had a lot of stems and not a lot of leaves in our, our cool season grass uh, pastures. Or in, we have a summer where we have this record setting heat and drought compared with the moderate temperatures that uh, we've had some summers and we have plenty of moisture and lots of forage in the summer. Or we have an autumn where we have zero stockpile because there's no precipitation. Or we have an autumn where we have a lot of stockpile because we had, we had some moisture and, and moderate temperatures. And then you add to it the winters uh, where the snow that old man winter brings us melts and uh, we end up with hay feeding events that look like first place mud runs at our county fair. I mean, this was literally my pasture uh, in the, the spring of 2019. Uh, that is supposed to be a fescue field, not a tromped up muddy mess. That saying that we have here in Missouri, Missouri that if you don't like the weather today, stick around, it'll be different tomorrow, might mean you like the weather better tomorrow, but it wreaks havoc for producers of grazing livestock because we never know what to expect. So how do we design that system that can accommodate that forage growth that we never know what to expect, that ever-changing forage growth? It's going to take a system to make that work and to be able to work year in and year out. And what works for one producer is not necessarily going to work for somebody else. So let's start by thinking about what is a management intensive grazing system. And I like to use this. I worked with Jim Garrish for several years and he used MIG, capital M, lowercase i, capital G. And it is a goal driven approach to managing your grasslands because cows will intensively graze by nature but only you can intensively manage. Management is what we want to intensify, not just to the grazing. So we're going to, if we're going to manage that uh, pasture, the, if we're going to intensively manage the grazing of that pasture, we're gonna start by dividing one big pasture into smaller cells that we usually call paddocks. And we're gonna limit the access of the livestock to one paddock at a time. So let's look now look at a few key concepts of grazing. Here we have, uh, Forage time is along the bottom, and as that forage plant grows, it gets bigger. We have higher yield. Yield is going to increase over time, but over time, the quality of that pasture is going to decline. And as that, past, as that plant grows bigger and becomes more mature, not only does the, the quality decline, but the growth rate of the leaves decline. That plant starts putting its energy into making seed uh, so that it can, can reproduce. And rather than putting its energy into making leaves. And most of the time we want rapidly growing plants that are putting leaves on and not stems and seeds. Um, there are certain, certain times a year we want certain plants to go to seed, uh, but for the most part in a grazing system, we're trying to manage plants so that we can keep them in that vegetative rapidly growing stage during, the, during most of the growing season. The second thing we wanna think about is keeping our roots healthy. If the roots stop growing, the leaves aren't going to grow very fast either. So it, we want to design a system where we can maintain that healthy, vigorous root system. In the grazing schools, we talk about the take half, leave half philosophy. And that comes from this information here, where when 50% of the leaves are removed, the plants, ju that's just when it starts to affect the roots. So if we can keep from removing more than 50% of the top of the plant, we're going to not have an impact on the bottom of the plant. Down here, if we're taking off 80% of the leaves, 
100% of the roots have, will stop growing in this study. And uh, when the roots stop growing, we're not going to be putting on those vegetative leaves. We want to limit that opportunity for, the, for cattle to come back in and graze that plant um, below that, below half, but you know, not take more than half of that plant. And so if, if we have a pasture that's 12 inches tall and we turn a cow into it, she's gonna go in there, wrap her tongue around those leaves and take about the top six inches off of the plant. We don't want her to come back and graze the, the next six inches. And we don't want her to come back and graze after that plant has started to regrow because all of those things will have an impact on the roots. Besides maintaining that healthy, robust root system for forage productivity, that also has an impact on water infiltration. And this study was done in 1937. You know, we're, that's pushing 100 years ago. Um, and so in, it was a, they looked at a three inch rainfall event in a 90 minute time period. And when they had excellent pasture with 95% ground cover, very little of that water ran off less than 20% runoff, so more than 80% infiltration. Compared to when the pasture was poor or had 50% ground cover, almost 50% of the water ran off. And when it did, it took with it the soil and nutrients. And so we want to uh, make sure that we're keeping that ground well covered so that the water will infiltrate uh, because having water in the soil can be the difference between grazing pasture and feeding hay during a drought. So we know we want to keep the plants vegetative, we want to keep the roots healthy, we want to store water, and we also want to graze livestock for a profit. So how do we design a system to meet those goals? The first question we, we're going to ask is how many paddocks do we need? It's a simple equation. We take the number of days we want to rest the uh, pasture for regrowth and divide it by the number of the days we're going to graze and add one to it because they can't graze a paddock and rest a paddock at the same time. So if we have a 33 day rest period and a three day grazing period, we're gonna divide our 33 days of rest by our three days of grazing to get 11 and then add one to it for 12. So we'll have a 12 paddock rotation. But seriously, when has grazing, raising livestock ever been simple? So the real answer is it depends. Do you remember when we defined management intensive grazing, grazing we said it was a goal driven approach to managing grasslands. If your, if your goal is to graze beef cattle 365 days a year uh, on a limited number of acres, then your approach is going to be different than if you have an off-farm job and you have to travel out of town for a week at a time. And so your goals are going to make a, uh, have an impact on the number of paddocks that you need. Also the animal performance that uh, the class of animals you're grazing and the performance you're expecting is also going to have an impact. If we're operating a grazing dairy, then those cattle need to be on a high quality forage diet that is consistent because fluctuations in forage quality show up in the milk tank. So moving them at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, will help maintain that consistently high quality forage diet. If we're feeding growing livestock like market lambs or yearling steers, we're trying to maximize average daily gain. And so we wanna provide a consistent diet again of high quality forage. If we are grazing lactating uh, animals that aren't dairy animals like beef cows or sheep or goats or horses, uh, we can get by with moving them every two to four days because even though they need a fairly high quality diet, uh, we don't see a, enough increase in animal performance to justify the extra time and labor of moving them more often than every two to four days. And if we have dry animals that are already in good condition, they will perform just fine on a, a, a four plus day rotation uh, because they just don't have the nutritional demand that those other classes of animals have do. The, the, the tricky part here is figuring out how long to graze a pasture based on the forage needs because you're always shooting at a moving target. When the plants are growing quickly, the grazing period can be as short as two days. And when the plant growth slows down, it can be as long as 12 days. So think about how often you mow your lawn in May compared to August. You know, that how quickly is that grass growing, especially if it's a cool season grass um, uh, lawn, how quickly, how often do you have to mow it in, in May versus August? So determining the grazing period is really about understanding the recovery period. When the forage is growing quickly in the early spring, we might be able to graze that paddock after two weeks of recovery compared to the summer when it's growing a lot, at a lot slower rate. It may take two months before we have adequate regrowth to uh, graze it again. 
the key is to avoid grazing that regrowth. We don't, don't want to leave them in there once those uh, plants have started to regrow. The growth curve of, the cool, of cool season grass like tall fescue looks like this. We have rapid growth here in the spring, but then during the hot temperatures of the summer, those plants really slow down. They may even go dormant. And then in the fall, when the temperatures cool, they'll start to pick up production again. So that means if we want to maintain that three-day grazing period for those lactating animals, when our forage is growing fast in the spring, uh, we need an eight paddock rotation. But in the middle of the summer, when it's growing much more slowly, we need a 16 paddock rotation. So you know that, that kind of throws a monkey wrench in our system. So we need to guide our grazing systems with a compass and not a roadmap. We need to have a direction for moving the livestock through the grazing system, but not necessarily a rigid plan that we aren't willing to, to change up. Even experienced grazers will tell us that they don't get it right every year. You can't outguess the weather, and sometimes you have to start with a plan and be willing to switch things up if something doesn't go the way you expect it. So here are some strategies for dealing with that ever-changing forage supply. Let's think about how to align forage demand with forage growth. Basically, you have to figure out how to grow enough forage every day you want to graze or grow it when the conditions are favorable and save it for a rainy day or a day when you don't have any rain and it's too dry to, for the, the plant and the plants aren't growing. So if we look at the nutritional demand for cows calving in March and April, we can see we have higher requirements here in April and May uh, when lactation is at its peak about 60 days post calving. It starts to drop off then after that peak, the, the nutritional demand for this cow is going to start to drop off after, after that peak forage, lac, uh, peak lactation point uh, until we wean the calf right here uh, in September. And then it, we have a pretty dramatic drop in uh, forage demand. And then it starts to, to work its way back up as that calf is, is growing and she gets closer to calving. And so we have a, a fluctuating forage demand for that uh, cow right there. If we're grazing a steer uh, what, that we want to gain 1.5 pounds a day over a 150 day grazing season, the, it doesn't, his, the nutritional demand doesn't, change, doesn't um, fluctuate, but it does increase. As that calf gets bigger, his nutritional demand increases. And so we need to have, he'll eat more every day as he gets bigger. Figuring how much forage the animals need is the easy part. Now let's look at that moving target. As, the, uh, as long as sunlight, plant nutrients, and moisture are adequate, our cool season grasses are going to be productive uh, based on temperature, or grasses are going to be productive based on temperature. The cool season grasses are going to be most productive when the temperature is in the 65 to 75 degree range. And those are grasses like tall fescue, brome grass, orchard grass, uh, timothy, Kentucky bluegrass. Those are cool season grasses. Our warm season grasses like big blue stem, Indian grass, eastern gamma grass, they grow best when the temperature is in this 85 to 95 degree range. Cool, se uh, cool season grasses grow over a wider temperature range over uh, you know, more, more of the, of the, the growing season, more days during the growing season. Uh, but the warm season grasses will definitely outperform them when the temperatures are hot. Again, here's this cool season yield cool season grass yield curve where we have um, you know a lot of productivity in the spring, not much in the summer, and again in the fall. One of the management strategies that we can use is to add nitrogen fertilizer. And so, if you have a high forage need in the spring, or if you are, are uh, going to be using uh, some of your pastures to make hay in the spring, adding nitrogen fertilizer can really bump up productivity here in the spring. But if you don't have a need for all this extra forage in the spring, then adding that nitrogen fertilizer isn't going to, to help you out if all you're going to do is brush hog off the stems in the middle of the summer. I like to call that recreational brush hogging, which we do a lot of here in North Missouri. Then here in the summer, again, we're not gonna have a lot going on. If we come back in here in the fall, uh, we can add some nitrogen fertilizer uh, to boost production and have some stockpile to graze during that late fall, early winter. We can add a, a cool season legume like red or white clover, and that's going to produ bump productivity up a little bit during the summer, but we're still going to have that shortfall here in the, in the late summer 
we could add a, a warm season grass to our, our system. And again, here we'll have this much more productive forage here in the heat of the summer. And so now that we've looked at what the animal needs and what the pasture can supply, how do we develop that flexible grazing system? And we're back to what are your goals? If you're buying stockers in December and you're gonna sell them at the, on, uh, you know, the first of July, then a cool season grass system like this is going to, to fit your needs pretty well. It's going to produce forage in the fall that you can, you know, the stockpile that you can graze here when you bring those calves in in the fall, provide some pretty high quality feed for them uh, in, the, in the late fall, early winter. And then productivity of your spring forage is going to be able to, to provide plenty of, of high quality forage for them. And here when this forage is uh, no longer being productive, you've already sold them anyway. What about if you purchase the stockers on June 1st and sell them in September and go to Texas for the winter instead of stay here where it's minus 13 next week? Um, then that warm season grass system is gonna work pretty well for you because uh, you don't need uh, productivity you know, in really early spring. You're gonna put those calves on, there when, on the pasture when they're light and their forage demand is going to be at its lowest. And so then as that forage is picking up in productivity, those animals are picking up in their need for, for forage, for nutrient intake. And so uh, we can, that warm season grass will work really well in that system. But if you have brood animals like cows or ewes or mares or nannies, you have to feed them 365 days a year. And so you need a system that'll provide more grazing days than just uh, a time when the animals are, have a peak nutritional demand. And so putting a cool season and a warm season grass system together uh, in uh, a, you know, have some paddocks that are cool season grass, some paddocks that are warm season grass so that you can complement uh, those two types of grasses can complement each other in a grazing system. Uh, will help provide some forage pretty much uh, all growing season and into the fall and winter with some stockpile. You can also add a summer annual like sorghum sudan grass, pearl millet or crabgrass, and they can be very productive during that summer slump period for the cool season grasses as well. So how do we get there? Here are some tools and strategies to help us along the way. One of the things that uh, MU Extension or, uh, has to offer is the grazing wedge. This is a tool uh, to help us track forage production. By moving through paddocks quickly in the early spring, we're staging them for the entire growing season. And the first time, uh, you may only spend a day in each paddock, but that will still stair-step those uh, paddocks for the rest of the, rest of the grazing season. And so we will start by measuring the, the forage that's out there. And you can do that with a yardstick. You can do it with what we call a rising plate meter, or we have uh, you know, some new technology using an ultrasonic pasture sensor uh, that we're seeing uh, used more and more. And it'll set up a grazing wedge that'll look something like this. And so here we have some paddocks that have been overgrazed. Over here in the yellow, we have paddocks that have been overgrazed. And here we have a paddock that's gotten too mature. This one in red is too mature. The ones that are here in green are right on pace for, um, you know, providing the forage that we need in our, in our, uh, in our grazing system. Early in the spring or in the autumn when we have a lot of stockpile, our stair steps may not be very steep. You know, there may be, they may be pretty similar, but if we've spent one day in each of these paddocks, or maybe this is a grazing dairy where they spent a half a day in each of those paddocks, moved through them very quickly, there's not a lot of difference in them, but it still sets up that wedge, that stair step uh, type of system uh, for those paddocks. What may happen later in the summer if you have a lot of forage uh, production is we may see a bunch of them that get too mature. And if we're following a roadmap where we think we have to go to the paddock with the most forage available, uh, we're going to be grazing animals on pasture that's too mature all through the season because before, by the time we get over here to these paddocks that are in green right now, they're gonna be too mature and have moved on. So maybe our best choice would be to uh, make some hay out of those, the paddocks that are already in red. And harvesting hay will reset that paddock. It puts them all back down there at, that, um, at the bottom of the, of the wedge. Uh, but owning hay equipment is expensive and getting hay put up without getting it rained on sometimes can be a challenge. And so sometimes we just have to drop them out of the system and let them sit until we can get somebody to come in and make hay. Or uh, we have animals that don't have that high uh, forage demand that we can put on those, those paddocks instead of 
uh, the ones that we that need that higher plane of nutrition. And so if we move in then here to this first paddock that's in green, um, we can then uh, start grazing and move our way through those paddocks. You know, later in the season, if we experience epic drought, we may have to go back and hit those paddocks that are in red. If we uh, haven't harvested them for hay, we can graze them. Even if they are mature, you know, uh, there have been times in our part of the world when it's been dry enough that mature stemmy forage is better than nothing because there wasn't hay to buy uh, even if even if there if you wanted to, you couldn't find any. So um, you have some options there with that. And here are some tools for when you have to go off road. You know, sometimes things just don't work and you have to completely um, rethink your whole plan. And using temporary fence is one of the things that uh, I think is a, is a very useful tool. In fact, I actually prefer to use temporary fence to start with until I really know where I wanna put my permanent fences. But you can pretty quickly take a couple uh, reels of poly wire or poly tape and some step-in posts and turn those eight paddocks into 16. Uh, and you know, uh, one of the things that, that we used when I worked at the forage systems research often, because we were uh, grazing fairly small groups of cows where it was uh, you know, just a barrel, or here's a portable, uh, you know, a, a 50 gallon uh, tank that they can move from one paddock to another with pull it around with a four wheeler. We've done that uh, as well. And so, using that temporary fence to go from those eight paddocks to those 16 paddocks can be very a very effective tool. Another thing that we can do if we need to, um, if we're running out of forage is to adjust our grazing period. We know that if the, if it's gonna be, uh, the forage is going to be in short supply, we can use that temporary fence to, to make our paddock size smaller and only provide a, a one or two day forage supply to our animals because if we, are moving, if we are moving them fairly quickly and only giving them a one or two day forage supply, we can increase our pasture utilization to nearly 70 to 70% 70 and above. If we are in a continuously grazed situation, we're only going to, the cattle are only going to eat about 30% of the forage that's actually being grown. If, if we uh, tighten up that grazing system so that they don't have access to as much of the area and, and uh, make them stay and eat just that smaller, um, in that smaller area, give that forage behind them or in front of them a little bit more rest, we can increase our pasture utilization pretty significantly. And so in a year when we are running out of forage, uh, when forage supply is short, uh, that can be a tool that we can use. We can also adjust our forage demand. We talked about how uh, animals demand drops pretty significantly when we wean that calf. And if we are out of forage and, and we need to reduce the nutritional demand of that animal, weaning that calf at 90 to 100 days, Dr. Bailey told me that's about the sweet spot for weaning a calf when you're trying to reduce the forage demand of that mama cow. It's more efficient to feed the calf separately than to feed it through the cow when forage is in short supply. And sometimes we just have to make a sacrifice. Some years we just have too much precipitation and even our endophyte infected tall fescue won't hold up cows in the winter. Uh, again, that is my pasture in uh, the, the spring of 2019. And, uh, and there are also years then when we don't have enough precipitation and we have to graze those pastures more than take, and we have to take more than 50% of the, of the leaves, leaf area. And so we're going to, we know we're going to do some damage to the roots. And so if we could, we can sacrifice one paddock and maybe only graze one paddock very short and feed some hay on that one paddock instead of grazing all the paddocks too short, uh, we can, those rest of those paddocks will recover much more quickly. So again, we may have to have that sacrifice pa uh, paddock, especially in wet weather, it needs to have easy access for feeding. You know, uh, several years ago, I came home and, and, they had been feeding hay and one tractor was stuck in the gate and the tractor, the second tractor they were using to pull it out was stuck in the yard, in the, you know, in the yard, trying to pull him out of the gate. And so, you know, you need to have easy access on those years when it's especially muddy. Uh, if you have several options to choose from, pick a paddock that needs to be rented in, renovated anyway. Or if you have a paddock that you always put annual forages in, use that one rather than destroy a permanent pasture. 
When you are able to begin grazing again, you wanna allow plenty of time for recovery because those plant roots not only have stopped growing, they've probably died back. And sometimes when it's muddy, they've even been completely dislodged from the soil. It may be necessary to reseed. And so uh, that could be a time for, again, renovation, or maybe you're just gonna add legumes or add um, you know, a, an annual crabgrass or something like that to a pasture. And sometimes our stockpile is covered in snow and the cows have to, the cows can graze through several inches of snow, but ice is a different story. When they walk through a paddock that has a lot of ice in it, those leaves will just, they'll just, they'll just go plink, 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 and they'll just break right off. And so um, you may have to feed hay, even if you have stockpile, especially here in North Missouri, we see it go down with ice in, in wet winters. And those pastures can get pretty trumped up. So you have to decide again, are you going to, uh, let them graze it and tromp it up like this? Or do you uh, confine them to a, a smaller area and uh, feed hay and, and not use that stockpile? So you have to decide which is, which is the route you wanna go.